welcome to another episode of Three Men in a War Game. I'm Paul, and strange things are afoot at the Circle K. I'm Kevin, and all we are is dust in the wind, dude. <laughs> and this is Potter, and I totally possessed my dad. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. Yeah. And, uh, and on today's episode of Bill of Ted, I mean, uh, Three Men in a War Game, we'll talk about Infinity Code 1. Again. Again. The Code Whoa. 1. Whoa. <laughs> but first, yeah. as always, Hobby Progress. Chops? Um, working on Kings of War. I uh, need to get this army done. It's a lot of models to get through. I uh, I think since the last time we recorded, I finished a unit of gigas, which are uh, in the game. They're just noted as it's like a crustacean on a 50 millimeter square base. And they, they rank up in two ranks of three or like I should say each rank is three. Right. So they're big crabs. So I got the big crab models from Wrath of Kings. Big crab, big crab chase. Yes, so I have a. It's a hundred and fifty millimeter wide base of crabs. It's crazy. It's so dang. Yeah, it's so big, so big. That's a lot uh, of crabs. Yeah, it's a lot of crabs. It's a lot of crustacean coming at you uh, with clamps, clampy crustaceans. Clamps. But I and I also have. I was gonna start working on my um, another unit called Placoderms, which I'm using the Deepman Calaxes from. Uh, Wrath of Kings 4. And I, it's funny, I put the base coats on and I kept looking at my Kraken model and going, mm mm, I want to paint that Kraken. So I switched gears and I started painting the Kraken. So I have a uh, Kraken that is about 95% done right now. Wow. Yeah, that one's looking good too. Yeah, it's painted like a blue ring octopus. So it's a, it's a blue ring massive squid. Oh, every time you show pictures of it, all I want to do is scream Squid Billy at it. It's so gross. It is very gross. And the more you paint it, the grosser it gets. Mm -hmm. But in a good way. Yeah, in a good, good, good kind of gross. In a good kind sure. of gross. Yeah, yeah, it means, it means you're doing your job. Yeah. So, is that all? Yeah, that's it for me. Paul, how about you been up to? Uh, not a whole lot. Uh, I've started working on my model for the uh, Maya Cast Master Glass. Dope. Um, yeah, so I'm pretty excited about that. I've got the skin, I think, pretty much done right where I want it. Uh, so now I'm working on some armor, and, and uh, I, got, I got that blocked out, and I'm going to start working on the uh, highlights and shading on that. Maybe this weekend, depending on how things go. Probably not this weekend. I'm going to be honest. Probably not this weekend. Uh, probably <laughs> probably not for another week or so before I really take time to sit down and paint. Um, but I'm really excited with how it's come out so far. Uh, it's, it's, it's starting to look pretty good. And obviously, I'll post pictures after it's submitted and posted for that because that's the rules. Right. I, uh, I actually picked a new model. And I haven't told you guys yet, but I can't even say it right now. So... Yep. It is what it is. Very cool. Yeah. Other than I can oh, tell and, you it's and, an artichoke. Oh. Go ahead. What, what was that? I said, other than I can tell you it's an artichoke. Uh oh. <laughs> uh oh. That's pretty cool. Uh, now, I'm, now, I'm, now I'm intrigued. <laughs> I'm very intrigued. Color you uh, and and the last time I think the last time we talked, I was working on contrasting up some O twelve, and I did finish uh, the whole wildfire set of O twelve models with contrast. Yep, nice. And I got to shoot good. them off the board. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Potter? What you've been working on? Uh, so I can't remember what where I was at on my my cast model last time we talked, but I'm done. She's done. She's finished. She's kaput. So I actually added some final details from that you, I didn't even show you guys yet on her. Uh, so I even went back and added more to her. But she's done. I'm ready to take pictures of her again with the new details on her to submit her for the Maya cast. Um, other than that, not much uh, because I have been sucked into the Cosmere lately and just been doing nothing but reading. Um and Yay. I will say that uh, finally, one of our local gaming stores got <laughs> Captain Rex in. So I finally went and picked him up for my clone army and got him built. So small, small victories. That's yeah, pretty cool, 
He was he was out for quite oh, a long man. time. Yeah, months, months. He was he was just not in stock. So I was I was very excited to get the call. So he is now built. Um, I've got my Padme built now too. So I think the only thing I don't own for clones at this point in time that's been released is the uh, the Rec uh, the Rec Pod, the Rec Escape Pod. So I think that's all I got left to pick up for clones. Nice. Oh, because you need R two. Yes, I need R two. Three PM. Mm-hmm. So. Other than that, no, awesome. not much. Uh, well, no, and I did start uh, painting uh, a Nis Marksman. Um, he's all all of his colors are blocked in, so now I just got to start shading and uh, uh, blending him up to his highlights. Nice. So he did so well in our game the other day that I uh, decided that he needed some paint. Yep, and mine did so bad I stripped them all and <laughs> As put them you in the should. microwave. You no, you just need <laughs> to throw your, your your models were fine. It was your dice you need to throw away. Well, I don't know. You, you you contribute that. Well, anyway, we'll get into that. We'll get into that. So, which which actually leads us into our topic of choice for tonight, because we've been sitting on COVID nineteen for gosh, what seventeen years now. It's been a long time. Uh, it feels like it. Yeah, it's it's been eighty four years um, of COVID, uh, but somehow all three of us have actually managed to go out and and play a game safely. Of course, but we all managed to go out and play a game. That's right, we have um, all played a game now. No, oh, it was yeah, the greatest and, thing ever. <laughs> and our 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 first game of choice when we got out of some COVID break was Infinity, which is great. Well, I guess I guess chops. At one point, you played some Relic Blade, so it wasn't your first, but it was. Uh, coincidentally, around the same time that Kevin or Chris and I were playing our game of Infinity, because Code One was our choice for first time out. Yeah, I mean, basically my first time. Yeah, so uh, that's what we're going to talk about because that came out in April, not long after uh, COVID hit, and so the excitement is still high, and we finally got to play. So we want to talk about our playing experience. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Um, all right, so uh, I guess let's start with let's start with the scenario. Chops, what what scenario did you end up playing? Uh, we played domination. We played twenty five points, five SWC. Man, How that sounds super familiar because that's exactly what Chris and I played: <laughs> twenty five points, five SWC, and domination. So did you did you like randomly pick that or did you uh, uh, just kind of look through and decide on it? No, I so, so I saw the domination. Well, because when they were talking about N four, one of the things that Carlos they they showed was a the, or the they did like a battle report, right? Mm-hmm. That they looked like they generated in TTS, and it seemed like they were playing domination. So I figured if this mission is going to be in both code one and in four, it would make sense to play it in code one um, as the release is coming in to get my, to get bearings. So that's why I actually chose domination as the, the mission we were going to play. Okay. Well, you did a, a, you put a little more thought into it than, than I did. Uh, because when I was looking at what Chris and I were going to play, uh, I looked at it and felt like it was more than just killing. And it was it like N3 type, Infinity stuff mm-hmm. where it was a multi-layer scenario. Yeah, right? domination and supplies are really the two missions that you get in um, Code One that have really good, um, not just killing objectives. Yeah, I, I liked right. it because it, it was you know it's multi-layer in the terms of it had the killing objective, it had button pushing, and it had zone control. So I mean, it, it hit right. on everything, which I felt was you know a really good way to. Maybe not introduce a new person, but someone like us who plays has played the game in the past before and is getting their re-wedding their palette for the game. It's I think it's a good scenario to go into. Agreed. Yeah, I I'm a I'm a pretty big fan of it. Uh, yeah, and it and it does have the the zone the quarter mm-hmm. table quarter control uh and and some button pushing uh which which makes it fairly dynamic without being overdone right so it's still beginner friendly it's still definitely code one friendly Mm -hmm. uh which which i i really really liked about it um yeah so and that's and that's why that's why i picked it i thought it was a although although supplies is a as a three flag capture the flag so that sounds kind of fun it sounds fun yeah so what size table did you guys play on we played on a four by four. Oh, so did we. Yeah, because just so one of the reasons why we we did that was because uh, 
when initially Chris and I talked about playing and we, we looked at playing the, the four by four and just doing the 30 points. Right. Right. Because that's, that's what's the, the max size for, for code one is a 30 point game. And so the problem with that is that right now with the way, with the models that are out for code one, it kind of puts you at a point where there's, the point ceiling is too high for the model options. Yeah, because with code one, you're you're limited to one battle group, or I don't remember what they call them in Infinity. But um, so because of that, when you you get above the ten model count, which is where it is at, it's limited at, at code one. You 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 still have a ton of points left at, at thirty points. Like I re- I remember some of the lists I was building. I still had four or five units going into another battle group. Because of the fact that I just had that many points left over after I hit my ten model cap. Yeah, yeah, and I don't, I don't think I was. I mean, unless I was going, all right, I'm putting in the most expensive mm-hmm. version of any model, and I'm sitting there going, well, I guess I can take Hippolyta. I guess I can take Liang Kang, and I guess I can take uh, Jose Cuervo, and and all that. I stuff. I mean, I was even taking Liang and a lot of for for Pano. The the only thing I didn't take in the list I was building was the Swiss Guard, which is the most expensive model that Pano can get right now in Code One. And like I was, I'm still taking the other super expensive units, and I'm still going into second battle groups because of the fact that it's just there's just so many points to deal with. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think every every list I tried building, I came up to about twenty eight points. Yeah, thirty. Th- I feel like um, with code one and thirty, we were missing some bigger models, right? Like models that were that will come in at the seventy, eighty, ninety, one hundred point range in N four, um, right? We, like tags and things, right? We just don't have them yet. Yeah. Um, so since we don't, the the um, 30.6 SWC just feels like so much. And 25.5 really makes you think more about the choices that you're going to bring yeah, into the match. That one was a lot more fun when it came from the list building because it felt more of what we said in our past Infinity uh, shows is about like the fact that the there are three there are three games that you're playing. In Infinity, you're playing the Infinity of the game. You're playing the terrain placement because it's part of it's like it's game of itself. And list building is a game into itself in Infinity as well too. And at the 25 uh, points, five SWCs, it felt way better. It felt like it was that bringing that the, the first part of the game into it again. Whereas at, so at 30 let's, points, let's, it first, didn't. let's take a step back for a second and and just talk about domination again for a minute. Um, for our listeners that don't play Infinity, don't know a lot about Infinity, maybe have listened to our Infinity episode, so they have some of the basics. Um, it, the, the the game of domination, uh, it, it has two deployment zones, and then a 4x4, four four, your deployment zones are 12 inches into the table. So basically you have the, you have your front quarter of the table that you can deploy into. And then in between the two deployment zones are four equal sized quadrants. And then each quadrant has a, and a single objective in the center of it. So you've got your four uh, consoles that are in the middle of your quadrants and your four quadrants. And now how domination is scored is at the end of each total game round, you look to see who has the most control of the four quadrants. If you and your opponent hold an equal number of quadrants, you each score one point. If one player is dominating more than their opponent, they get two points. And then at the end of the game, if you have uh, every console that you have interacted with most recently, so if you are the player who has most recently interacted with a console, you get one point for each one of those consoles you control. And it's important to note that the only people who can push the consoles or make the rolls on the consoles are specialists. And so specialists for the for Infinity and for this, this specific mission in general are hackers, special oper- special operatives, Doctors, engineers, paramedics, and troops that are considered specialist troops. And it's also worth noting that most specialist troops cost SWC, which are your special weapons points. When we, when you hear us saying the term SWC, that's standing for uh, special weapons points. And those are points you normally pay for your heavy guns. So your machine guns, your spitfires, 
uh, your HMGs, uh, your Red Furies, the big guns that do the big damage, the scary stuff, those things cost your SWC. So when you're doing 25 points, 5 SWC, you're down a special weapons point, which means you have to really balance between taking your heavy weapons and your specialists. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, I just wanted to like narrow into that point because that's what actually makes the, the list building meteor at 25 five, uh, is because you just have less, um, wiggle room. Right. And, and you, you, the reason that, you know, at, at six third, at, at 36, that extra SWC typically, I mean, that's a whole HMG, right? right. Like that's another right. big gun. Yeah. I mean, that's a, the, <clears throat> that or two hackers or, you know, two specialists. So exactly. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's a big, that's, that's, you, you, I think you hit the nail on the head. That's, that's what really makes the list building, you know, frustrating and fun at the same time, because you're going to want, you know, depending on the game size, depending on the scenario, um, you know, you're going to want three or four of these button pushers, these, you know, these specialists to make sure that you got redundancy and you got enough to do what you need to do on the field. Sometimes I know in some of the N3 scenarios, there were a lot of buttons to push sometimes and you really needed those people. And the nice thing is, is like these, these people, like the engineers, the doctors, the paramedics are also other feeling, you know, fulfilling other combat roles with fixing your tags, healing your people. Um, if, you know, if they go knocked out, you know, your doctors, or your paramedics can hopefully revive them and bring them back so that way they can generate, um, order tokens again. So, I mean, they're, they're other, they're feeling, fulfilling other combat roles as well, too. Yeah, which is which is pretty awesome. So let me ask you this, Kevin, because in the in the Code One rule book, or I guess, and also you, Chris, uh, I'm just lumping you in with me. With the with the Code One rule book, the recommended table size for a 25 point game is not four by four. Mm -hmm. Trying to scroll real quick to find out what those exact dimensions it's are. It's 32 by you know, 48. 32 by 48. So it's close. It's just mm -hmm. you know uh, uh, four inches shorter. On the one side, so you're yeah. still playing wide, but it's not as deep. I'm it's, assuming it's that's two, what it looks so like. It's, it's two operation maps because the operation maps are 24 by 32. Right. So you put two next to each other, and it gives you a 48 by 32. Okay. That makes sense why they did that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you feel? Do you feel because it's you know looking at that right? So so with that table you're playing long ways ways at 48 inches right and it's mm -hmm. just narrowing the the table a little bit how did you feel playing on a four by four did you feel like it was missing because obviously i feel like they think that it's gonna push you know at that point level it's gonna push the models closer together and create more interaction which you want oh but with but with playing down five points how did did you feel that it fit or or no no well both of us had 10 orders to start like we both filled a full combat group mm-hmm um, you know, and obviously we didn't know that till we got to the table. We just agreed on 25 five. Um, but we, we both filled out a full combat group and 10 models on a four by four in infinity does not feel too close together. No, it doesn't. <laughs> um, for people who've never played infinity, the, your typical weapons range, like your typical effective weapon range is b like s somewhere between eight inches and 40 inches, right? Like, because the, there are different weapons bands and each weapon is optimally effective at a different range. There are four, I think four or five range bands in that like zero to four feet that a weapon can go. And some weapons can't fire out past a certain distance, right? right. Um, but the key is to note that that at 48 inches, um, your, your shotguns feel limited as they should. Your HMGs feel dangerous as they should. Where if you were only starting on that 24 by 32 and you get eight inches up the board, um, you can – you know, if you have a model that has uh, infiltration, you could pretty easily get into shotgun range in a single order in some cases, which doesn't feel right. So I, I think that 48 by 48 is actually a really good size for 25 point games, especially if you're building to 10 orders. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think you're, I think you're right on that. Yeah. I mean, in our, in our game, Paul, like I felt the same way. I mean, we both, we, I think you were at 10 orders and I know I was at 10 orders. I was at You're nine. You're at nine, okay. Yeah, but I mean, it's I mean, close it's enough. A, I mean, I still, I still hit thirty points. Yeah, so. but it, I mean, it's mm -hmm. the same way. Like, I felt like 
I mean, turn one, we're shooting at each other. You know, oh, there, yeah, there was, sure. there was, there was no, I didn't feel like there was any gap in, and, and as someone that primarily plays military orders, uh, sectorial for Pan Oceana, I'm used to only having 10 models, you know? Yeah. So for you, it's just normal, right? right? Like that's just like 10 models is all I ever get. So this is cool. I'm good with this. Yep. Um, yeah, I agree. I, re- I really think that, that 10 is fine. I don't think there's any problem with it. You know, and, and there's some things to be said, right? Because there's no smoke in code one. And I think smoke could make the smaller tables more palatable. <laughs> but because there isn't smoke, it, it's also beneficial to have that, uh, that 48 inches because then you can't put an HMG somewhere and be threatening every model on the board, right? right? You're not going to be, you're not right. going to be, you're not going to have six AROs on a model at any given time. Whereas on a single code one board with a single set of wildfire fire terrain or, 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 uh, called strong terrain, it's possible that you might have four or five AROs right off the bat when somebody starts moving. Right. Um, right. And when you have a four by four dense table, that's just not going to happen. Yeah. I mean, the, those things come with a ton of like scattered terrain, but the, the big bulky buildings and stuff for you to hide, truly hide behind to hide your profile. Yeah. It's, it's not a lot in those box sets. And so my opponent, Aaron, I think said it best when we were playing. So we were in turn three and I was like, I, I was the, I was start player. So I was at the top of turn three, taking my turn, right? So t- going first and the third turn. And I looked at the table and I said, God damn it. All my options suck. And he's like, that's how you know infinity is a good game, right? Like <laughs> when, when you have to think critically because everything you do is risky, you know you're right. playing a really, really good game because it's forcing you to really like get into that brain case, right? And, and you really have to crunch those muscles and figure out what you're going to do and how you're going to come out on top. And and basically, that's a, he, he said that too. He said, I felt that way on turn one, the way that you went first and you set up so that I could literally move nowhere. <laughs> like, yeah. It's uh, that's just how infinity works. It, it sounds like a lot of the conversations you guys had were the same conversations Paul and I were having because he was complaining about the same thing about his side of the table. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I and I still wonder. Uh, well, I guess I guess we can talk about terrain in a second, but yeah, I, that that's definitely something Chris and I talked about. You know, as as we were playing, was the the dynamics of the table and the dynamics of moving and. Uh, how, you know, even, even, even though the game did not go well for me at all, I definitely think there were times where Chris was going, Oh, I'm going to do this. And then he'd look around and be like, Ooh, I don't know that I want to take a shot from a Farabach and an HMG at the same time. Right. So, so, you know, right off the bat, the, like that type of thinking, and then that's, that's where the game intrigues me, uh, is that it, it gives you those, options and bad options you know it's not you know it's it's making you think of of how to turn the situation good and there's not a lot of games out there that force consequences onto you during your turn yeah the thing the aro is the ever like when you read the infinity rules right it's really hard to really understand how game defining the aro is Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it, it is the lifeblood of the game for that exact reason, right? Yep. It, it the, yeah, so because the arrow because, turn for you matters more than your actual turn sometimes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, and and reacting to reacting to your opponent's arrows, mm-hmm. right? Like, and and figuring out how to, you know, get get yourself to to move forward and and. Target selection becomes super important, super important as you're playing the game. And, and the other thing I'll say, sorry, I just came to the front of my mind and it feels important, is that a lot in a lot of games, you can position defensively. You can, right? But it means something completely different in Infinity. I think Infinity is one of the only war games where you can truly set up defensively because of the fact that you are allowed to immediately react to everything your opponent does if you, they cross into your sidelines. It enables true defensive play in a way that no other war game does. Mm-hmm. I agree to that. Yeah, and that's and that's where it really gets it gets dynamic, right? Like that's where all the the dynamic uh gameplay comes in because then then you're really thinking about your positioning you're thinking of how you're moving you're thinking of where you're going 
Um, and everything just to move, you know, one guy becomes a thought process in your brain of, of what your best options are. Well, that also, right? that also plays into your list building as well, too, because you as a player may go, you know, I do better with playing more of the defensive game in, in Infinity. So you may build a list that is almost a pure offensive or, I mean, a defensive list. You know, so you you build these specific, you know, when you're playing a sectoral, you can build a fire team that's specifically just their only job. These four models, these five models, their only job is to be defensive. And it it, it you can change that in this game. Like, not many games are like that where you, you choose, do I want to be offensive? Do I want all-rounders? Do I want to be offensive? It's it's nice that you've got that, that decision process when you're building your list and you're building your army and you're thinking about what you want to play. But also noting that models don't have to be one or the other, Correct. right? Like when you when we're when we're talking about so Paul mentioned a weapon called a Fowerback, which is a absolutely horrifying weapon if you're on the other side of it. And I'm assuming it was a gamma that that yep. Paul was using, which is a big uh, heavy model investment. We're talking about like a quarter of your army points, or a sixth of your army points, I guess, or fifth, depending on your your point value. But a very costly model, and the Gamma is a very good ARO piece because the Fowerback is effective at an extremely long range. But also, the Fowerback, uh, in this case, from a Gamma, is very good at playing a specific kind of offense, and that's clearing a lane for a faster specialist troop. Mm -hmm. Because Fowerbacks are especially good at picking off ARO pieces, Yep, unless you get crit. <laughs> yeah, that, that can happen, but yep. that's the risk, right? <laughs> Damn it. Sorry. That, I mean, yeah, yeah, sorry. That, that is the risk, right? But they also have armor six, right? So you have a little bit of that space marine, you know, faith is my armor situation. Not if your rolls suck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you told me yeah. that thing was armor six, I was like, what? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, armor six is, is it's, it's pretty dead. good. But if you roll a one on armor six, you're still a well, seven. Well, I hit him with a I hit him with an AP <laughs> yeah. weapon too, so that didn't help. Yeah, so and then armor three, right? But like yeah, uh, a AP dual action, all that shit. So yeah, it um yeah, it can get pretty gross. But in, in any case, what I'm saying though is that like even your defensive pieces can become very good offensive pieces, and you're even though you're you're thinking about what are my defensive options. Those models can pivot role mid game, mm-hmm. and it, it makes the game feel like a real combat exercise in that you have to very quickly think on your feet and adapt. Yep. Yeah, and and that's one of those things where playing all the N three before before COVID, I, I was I was just at that point of understanding. Uh, how infinity miniatures and units are are very much meant to have a specific battlefield role and and being able to play that and also accepting the fact that you know like any type of of combat situation not everybody's going to partake at the same level right right, right. like not everybody's going to be be as centered as other people and and that's actually like a, a fairly big thing in the game. Like I've I've had miniatures that one game sat there and didn't have much to do, and then in another game completely dominated the field. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, and 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 it all depends on that sin, that the situation where they're positioned and and how they can best contribute. So it it, it makes for a very interesting. Uh, replay value because you're not necessarily going to get the same work out of the same guy every time. And that's where the, the order system where you can apply your orders to whatever model you want is super great. Yeah, I mean, that's mm-hmm. like, you know, in the game we played, you know, to, to use a real example, you know, I brought a cheerleader, a fusilier, you know, very cheap model. He's really only there to, you know, give me orders in my order pool. I set him in the backfield, but I set him in such a way that he would be able to protect the rest of my backfield because line of sight is an issue. The the models only have a 180 degree line of sight. So anything in their back arc, unless they've got uh, 360 vision, they can't see. So if something goes back there, they can get shot and they'll never be able to ARO. So I set the piece up in a, in a place like, yeah, I'm not going to activate this model but at the same time, he's protecting my team. He's doing a key thing. And it had you never put a dropped a piece back there, he would have never done anything. But luckily, you put a piece back there and he got to do some work. 
He pivoted. And, he but, was still and, contributing and, and, his orders. And correct. Yeah, he's right. contributing to the overall success of the team. And the fact that you had him positioned where you did, watching his buddy's back, changed how I had to drop in uh, Cuervo into that into that combat. Like he had to drop in behind the building, right. as opposed to dropping in kind of out in the open and being able to to attack you from there. Yep. That's why you only had nine models because you brought Cuervo. I was thinking what the difference between our two lists was, and Cuervo would have made my list a lot more expensive. Yeah, because he's three points three or three and a half, four, depending yeah. on the. He has two different profiles, so it depends. I, I on took the take. three and a half point one. Yeah, the boarding uh, shotgun. Boarding shotgun. Yep. 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 Yeah. Oh so god, good. yeah. I didn't even get him into melee, but he he did. Good. I shot him off the board because he, he. But the it was revenge for him killing my knight's justice before I ever got to use her. Um. Yeah, he's a great model. Um. I uh, I considered taking three lambdas <laughs> or two lambdas oh, into my game. Um. Or not lambdas? Sorry, I had that wrong. The um, deltas. The deltas. Yeah, I considered yeah. bringing three deltas. Those are the jump into the ones? game. Yeah, because they're AVA four and they're par- they're parachutists. Yeah, mm-hmm. they're awesome. Um, I, with- I yeah, and I did have I did have a delta in there too, but I couldn't I couldn't clear out the stuff that was preventing him from coming in, right? Because all my guys basically shit the bed, and because because here's here my goal. Uh, and maybe we're getting too far into the game mm-hmm. uh, specifically on this. But what I wanted to do, because he had a TRO bot, uh, a total reaction bot, which if if you don't know, uh, in Infinity, when you are doing an ARO, you are you only get to roll one dice. And that's your disadvantage is that you're not firing as much as, as your opponent who's getting three or four dice or, you know, two, depending on the whatever weapon. weapon they're using. Yeah. Uh, but a total reaction bot gets their full burst. So my goal was to drop him in in a position where the bot couldn't see him and then hack the bot. Oh, that's uh, cute. And, yeah, put him in carbonite. But the problem is that there was uh, other guys that were kind of that I wanted to clear out, but my guys just couldn't take him out. So So you had a he, Delta hacker as well as Cuervo? <laughs> yeah. Oh, fucking yep. sweet. Dude. That's a that's a fun one-two punch. I, I mean, I was I was really excited from when uh, the moment I saw where where Chris posted or put up his uh, his bot, I was like, all right, I can drop in, you know, right near and, and meet the requirements of not touching terrain, but I can be at an angle where that bot can't see me. And this is another fascinating thing about Infinity that I want to talk about is that you and I look at these because so we talk about a delta. Let's just let's just s- s- focus on this for a second. So sure. the delta is a as I said, combat jump parachutist model. So a model that can, you can hold them in reserve. And then you, if you, if they, if they pass a role in the game, they are allowed to drop in on the board wherever they'd like to. Right. Um, it's not but an they easy also have parachutist. So they can walk in from a table edge too. Right. So it's that's not, another option. Exactly. It's not as easy uh, a role as you would like, but it's passable. And I, I pass mine in the game. But the thing about the Delta is that the Delta has six different profiles that you can bring. So it's not just that you bring a Delta. It's what weapon package Mm -hmm. and specialization that Delta has. And I didn't even consider bringing a Delta hacker into my game. And Paul had a really effective use for it, where for me – I prefer the Delta boarding shotgun doctor kit because if somebody gets knocked down, they can come into where they get knocked down and the boarding shotgun at close range is lethal. And then they can also possibly bring their boys back. That's a good, that's a good kit combo though. I mean, that is nice. Boarding shotgun med kit is gross on a drop troop. That's really, because I think, so I think for military orders, I only have one drop troop, but I don't think I get a doctor. That's a nice, I never it's even thought really about that profile. even being a possibility. That's a nice combo. Yeah, it's a really good profile. And, and he even – you even – for another point, you can get a peripheral doctor too. So you can bring in the Yudbot and the Delta. Nice. Um, so it, it's pretty cool, man, the options that the Delta has. But the point I wanted to make though is that in list building in this game, how we talked about it as a, as an essential part of the game is that Paul and I probably each spent 35 minutes to an hour to maybe longer building these lists for this game and came up with completely different things for the same mission. And utilizing yeah. certain same models. 
Yeah, exactly. Just that just that one little bit of a loadout and thinking of how we were going to use it, because I because I was honestly thinking with him was, all right, you know, at some point there's going to be some heavy infantry or a bot. I want him to be able to drop in and hack that hack the bot or hack the heavy infantry and carbonite them and get them shut down. Yeah, I mean that, and that's yeah. a smart and that's a smart play going against Pano. See, where my thought was I brought the razor hacker because the razor hacker has infiltration, which means I can put it halfway up the board. And if I'm smart, halfway up the board means I'm one four inch move in camouflage from any of the the consoles. The consoles yeah. Right. Right. So we just thought about we thought about where we wanted to put our hackers in very different ways. And the other thing is that I wanted a hacker with mimetism six so that it wouldn't oh. just get shot off the board. Oh. Um, and surprise attack. Gross. Yeah, and surprise attack. I'm right. so glad I had yeah. so much uh, multispectral visors. MSV. I had so much MSV. Well, so I brought so I brought two NIS because NIS are availability too. So I brought I brought a hacker and I brought um, my sniper. And because I for whatever reason, when I was building my list, I was like, Paul's going to bring Shavasti. Got mimetism out the ass in Shavasti. So I was like, I'm bringing all the, the multi, the MSV that I can. And he brought freaking cops, space cops. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, but it, 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 it killed the Omega yeah. with your MSV too. So but that that's, was... that sniper. Uh, Chops, that sniper did so much work. I think, uh, yeah, my, my turn, game too. My, I, so I, I also for, so, uh, O12 also has a, a sniper with MSV2, and I also brought that into my game, and it did so much work. Like, that, he basically shut down for me a that quarter did of the any, anything good, because he, he's the only guy that actually passed any armor save. Yeah, but he was, <laughs> the problem was he was, and, I mean, and he took, like, game. he took, he took shots to the face. Yeah. Like, like, I was like, I don't understand how this guy is still up there. Taking these hits and my gamma folded like a wet paper. Guys, bag. can we talk for a second about cool? So let's talk about epic moments in our games. Yeah, yeah, my, yeah. Let's, so let's. My razor, my razor survived three three orders of boarding shotgun. Ooh. So six six armor rolls. Damn! Without my mimetism, right? It's like six template rolls. <laughs> oh, jeez. Wow. Yeah, my I think it was so dumb. I think the the game the 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 game of the game of the day for me was my my uh, sniper, my my NIST sniper. He basically like I'm just imagining in in, in this like he moved up, took a position, fired, killed a dude. Scrambled up, took a position, fired, killed a dude. Scrambled up. Oh yep. shit, I died. <laughs> right. right, but if you think about that, right, and and here's one of the things that you did really well, right, is that you. Picked good targets. I didn't know what I was you shooting were, at. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, no, no. But it didn't matter what you were shooting at, right? It didn't matter what was what was the other model was, right? But you were able to say, okay, if I take out that unit, I can move forward more. Right. And then I can clear out that unit, which is going to open up my specialist to be able to get to this quarter and... And that yeah, that was uh, that was his whole goal goal for for the sniper was to basically go up, try and remove anything that was going to shoot at the hacker that was going up to grab right. the because I got the hacker into the console the next turn. Right, which is which is exactly how you want to play that, and you 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 picked good options, right? I was hoping that my armor saves would make you spend more orders to do it. Yeah, but, but with, du with dual, you know, with dual I, action in the in the uh, AP on the fact that in Code One that this, the multi sniper rifle the the armor piercing round also has dual action in it. Well, or, or, well, it's it's burst two now instead of dual action is sick to me. Like that. That felt a little much. That that I felt like maybe needed to be tamed back. But again, I know they're going for a smaller game size, smaller. But table that's size. only on the active turn, right? True. And that means that you're that means that you're putting your sniper in it, that that means you're spending orders on your sniper in your active turn. And generally, it is not wise to put your sniper in a position to take an ARO, right? Because of the fact that AROs can just kill you. Right. Um, it's never a good idea. Be and, and generally, even you're, you're still on two on one dice, which isn't as good in your favor. Correct. Um, so the fact that you were even using your sniper in your active turn is pretty ballsy, right? Yeah, see, it's I don't typically know what I'm doing an ARO with an, piece. Yeah, I don't know what I'm doing with an infinity yet. <laughs> 
<laughs> I don't know how to play this game. No, but no, but no. I, I mean, you can definitely take a sniper on on your active turn. You I don't. Can. I don't think there's any reason not to. You can, honestly. but depending on. So, so here's the situation, right? So, in, in my game, my I, I I washed away my opponent deployed, and I put all my MSV in a place where all of his camo markers were. And right. the models that so I you knew. played O twelve into Shazvasti, no, or? into into Yu Ching. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, I guess that's one thing that we that I had meant to ask him. I don't think we ever did was what we were playing. Yeah, so, I played so you o- and I both played O twelve, uh-huh. Kevin, uh-huh. and then Chris, you played Pano, mm-hmm. and Aaron played Yu Ching. Yep. Okay. Cool. Um, and he took a lot of camo and a lot of mimetism. Um, but I asked him, I was like, okay, what's this model's mimetism? What's, Cause he deployed first, right? And so I put all my MSV into the areas where I could cover where his models with, uh, with mimetism were going to be coming up the board. And I also put, I put my sniper on a second floor of a, of a building and he just peeking out of cover in the same building was my gamma. So mm-hmm. the gamma was what I used to take active turns and shoot because the fower back has a similar effective range to a sniper rifle. And I used the fower back as the offensive piece because six armor and burst three, right? Uh, and I just left the sniper there for MSV2 and AROs on my uh, defensive turns, on my inactive turns. Right. Um, but that's not to say I, I did actually give my sniper two orders. And that's not insignificant if you think about the overall, you know, 10 models, 30 orders over a game. I did give the the sniper two active orders, but still, like, it's not like I'm sitting there going, order, shoot, order, shoot, order, shoot with right, the sniper. Right. What- See, I, th- I think, I think with the, the, the bad decision on my part was that initially I deployed my sniper prone, which then also gave Chris one less target to choose from. Sure. And cut out the arrows that I I had, so I I think that was a bad idea. And I and the other thing I did is that I should have had my omega because I had my omega and my my gamma kind of covering the same field of fire. Oh yeah, that's not not optimal. Yeah, it wasn't optimal, and and. Uh, the, so basically, the sniper was kind of in the center of the table, and my gamma was to the left of him, and then my omega was on the extreme left from there. So I should have had my one of them on the extreme left and moved the other one to the extreme right. And yeah. that, and I think so. And I think having the sniper up to kind of cover both of them would have been a better option on my part. But and see you know, what live and learn. Yeah, yeah. right. And, and it all depends on what your opponent does too, right? Like my I, Aaron was very stealth heavy on one side, so I put the MSV two sniper on that side, and then he had a missile launcher and his specialists that were basically haunting up the other side of the board. So I put my copper box on that side right um or the the hmg total reaction bot right see and i and, and i think when i deployed i was specifically I, I think i was specifically trying to avoid that bot but i should have been a little more aggressive towards it uh i think that would have yeah I, overall i think that was i think that was the beginning I, I think strategically that was my bad point but there either way with the with the lack of good saves that I had and the fact that I rolled zero crits on the game and Chris rolled four, like four I think. four or five. I got, I got super hot with the crit. Yeah. When, I, when all yeah. that was and happening, like every, and, I, I was shocked. It was, yeah, it was so, I mean, it was, it was a, it was a bad day uh, for, for the numbers for me, but you know, overall, I mean, it was, it was still fun. It was a good game. Um, How and did it I turn think, out? What was the score at the end? Uh, so I took. I think it was six, six nothing. Yeah, I think because I took. I ended up taking. Yeah, it was bad. Two. Con- I took two consoles, and I took. Um, no, I think it was. F- you had you had your the quarters on your side of the table like every turn. Yeah, because so, you didn't have because for whatever reason you you didn't get a strong push into yours on your side. <laughs> So which allowed me well, to Well the reason why I didn't get a strong push into mine is because by the end of the top of turn one I was three point three activations down right. of the Because I went first. Seven seven that were on the table. Um and one was a sniper in a place where you know he was on top of the building. Yeah. Uh and you had at that point, you know, my my Omega was dead at the end of your turn. My beta was dead at the end of your turn. And one of my Kappas was dead at the end of your turn. And my Gamma had one wound on it. Right. Yeah. So all, all of my – so two of my heavier P 
pieces were gone. The other one was half dead. And then on my first activation, I used his, his lieutenant order to try and take out one of your guys to clear some space. And you crit me back and I failed my roll. Yeah, I think there so was, was I think that's where the key, my key dice rolls were on that was a lot of my crits came from arrows. Right. They weren't even. Right. Yeah, so that's when you want to roll the crits. Yeah, uh, exactly. Right. So I mean, it was it was it was a it was bad. It was it was just straight up, you know, bad luck. You picking good targets and me having bad luck. Uh, so I never I never really got to push out. And by the time and because my guys when they were shooting like losing the gamma without him taking anybody out and the sniper, uh, even though he was trying to take things out, wasn't having any luck getting through things. You know, it, it put me in a position where I. I couldn't clear out enough midfield stuff to be able to force him to move up the stuff in his backfield. So I was never able to get my drop troops in to a position where uh, I could, you know, come in behind him or or even clear out the middle of the field and, and drop them in there. So it was it was it was a tough position. So so even when I did manage to get my drop troops in, they dropped into the backside of your zone. So they were never actually able to claim anything either. Right. And, and then everybody I moved up in any way, shape or form was dead. Yeah. And here's what right? here, here's why all this matters. Right. So we're talking like specific details about the games. And, and I think the thing that's really important to note uh, about what we're talking about. And as you're listening, even if you're not necessarily fully comprehending all of the different terminology that's being thrown out, is that this game is incredibly dynamic and it constantly forces you to be evaluating and reevaluating the board state. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, I'm guessing, Paul, you never felt like you were totally out of it. Right, like that. No, there were there were always times. You know, it was it was a bummer, and and this is kind of the thing that I've I've learned through my Infinity games is that you're going to lose models, mm -hmm. oh, right? Yeah. And you're going to lose them at the top of turn one if you're player two, right? So you're not even going to start a turn where where you're getting stuff, and you might even lose stuff if you're player one at on the top of turn one, right? So so there's always that, and and you always feel like you you have a chance. So like even with me going down three orders uh, into my first turn, you know, losing a third of my, my units already, I still felt good about the game. Yep. Yeah. And because you did now, now when, now when you, now when you crit the crap out of my gamma on his one activation, but luckily I was smart and used his Lieutenant activate his Lieutenant order, which could only be used on him. So I didn't waste a full on order. Right. Right. So and then I was able to even at that, I was still able to drop Cuervo into your backfield, who then took out two mobs. Yeah, because Cuervo took out the two. And then I think one of your other ones took out my paramedic. So which by the end of turn two or end of turn one, I was down three orders as well. Right. So, you know, even even though I had bad luck, I was still able to have an effect on, on the game for you. I mean, yeah, because right? you took so, out, you know, you took out a key piece of mine, which was my, my Knight's Justice. You know, she, you know, she was hiding in the backfield waiting for the lanes to be cleared because she is such a, a melee oriented model. And you drop that dude in there in her backfield. And once you killed the Fusilier, that which was protecting her back, there's nothing I could do. Right. Right. So, so it gave me that opportunity to use what I had to be able to, you know, feel like there was, there was a chance, right? Like, so I, because really the goal there was to force your guys out of the backfield and then drop guys into your backfield and, and then have you stuck in the middle, right? right? If, if things had gone a little bit better, like even if I had, you know, only lost the, the beta trooper on turn one, you know, and still had a gamma and an omega to be able to kind of force that or take a, even just one or two more out early or, early, earlier on. Um, you know, so that was that was kind of the goal. And and I still I still had a slight chance of, of doing that. Granted, it was an uphill, you know, it, it can feel like an uphill battle, but things even out pretty quickly in Infinity. And that's one of the interesting things game design wise, where you can be like any other game. Or, or most other games where you look at that number of losses on the top of a turn, uh, or even, you know, before you go and it's like, oh man, I'm, I'm in trouble. There's no way I can come back, but it feels like infinity has this great dynamic way of, of making that 
not true and yeah. and that you are still in the game. Yeah. It all comes back to the arrow, right? Mm-hmm. Because you can answer back on your inactive turn. Right. Yep. Yep. And, and you get lucky with a crit or, or anything like that. So, yeah, because what, happens, right, so because what happens, right, the reason is because you lose a model, and then you're like, oh boy, I just took some losses, but I still have a couple orders left, so I'll position as defensively as I can, right? right. And then you're having, you're giving yourself the chances to be able to do some damage in, in your opponent's active turn. Right. Yep. Exactly. All right, so so we've we've kind of waxed poetic, and we've talked uh, cool stuff that's happened in the game and all that. So let's go. Uh, let's let's reel it into thinking uh, what we really liked, and uh, uh, as far as Code One goes, and and if there was anything that we uh, maybe didn't like. Sure. So I'll, I'll go because I have a pretty succinct point here. So Infinity Code. I think Code One is an amazing way to get into infinity it is like it feels like playing n3 right it, it gives you the soul of infinity and you i don't feel like you if you wanted to just stick with code one you could but if i'm being truthful i want to play a game with smoke grenades i want fire teams like i want the things that bring that that in four are going to bring but even that being said uh i think that i am very much looking forward to the support of code one the addition of missions Mm -hmm. and more profiles coming into the system because it is a very deep and very rewarding way to get into this game and play this game anytime i agree yeah, and, and, and here's the thing is I, I really feel like if you wanted to play this as your main game, Code 1, and not get into N4, you can. I feel like you could have a really good time playing this. It, so just Code 1, just playing Code 1, the game is, uh, in my opinion, it's a better game than 95% of the skirmish games on the market. Like Oof, you're that's... you are playing a you are playing a top five percent skirmish game playing code one of any other game on the market period. Yep, I fully agree with that statement. Okay, I mean I I loved my game of code one. Um, I guess for me because I, I think I was I was struggling with with N three. Um, I was I was struggling to wrap my head around a lot of the things, and then COVID happened, and I. I think that hurt, hurt and dampered. The one thing I liked about going into Code One was the felt I felt like because there were no sectorials, because there were no of the the top end heavy rules, you know, grenades, uh, panic tests, and things like that. It felt like I was able to focus on the basics, and I didn't have the background noise of everything else there, and it allowed me to play. I I enjoyed playing Code One better than any in three game I had ever played. Now my, my just to note out there, my experience within three was potentially maybe four games. So not much at all. So I'm, I am very new into this game, a very much a new, and I understand that, but I enjoyed code one more than I did anything else. I like the new profiles and how it spells things out for you a little bit better. So I'm not having to search the rules as much. Um, you know, I think having a printout of the weapon profiles on hand would be a little bit easier going forward in the future for me. But just not having the extra bloat and being able to focus and learn that, like I am looking forward to playing nothing but Code One for the next few months and slowly transition into N Four because I, I feel like I'll be a better player for it. Yeah, it, it, you, you nailed it on the head when you said the fact that it allows you to focus on the the fundamentals of infinity, which is how to move, how to think about mm-hmm. your inactive mm-hmm. turn, uh, and how to manage losses, right? Like those, those things, like those fundamentals of playing this game, um, code one gives you all of those. And it, it, again, it gives you the feeling, the, like the feeling you get, right. The like grindiness and the, the crazy decision-making and the insane, like decision space that infinity provides, uh, code one still gives you. Yep. So, yeah. I mean, it's all there. You just don't use, there aren't bulky rules, you know, that, that, that are in, the, and even in, I mean, bulky is the wrong word because I feel like that gives a negative connotation. There's just it's extra just rules that give the game more overhead. flavor. 
that yeah, are, that there's are, lots of mental, but like you said, with guts checks right. and all that stuff, there's just a, there's a lot of other mental overhead, right? That it goes into your decisions in in M three and M four that aren't in Code One, right? But at, um, at but the that core, doesn't stop Code One from being a great game, right? At the core, it's still the same exact game. Yes, you, exactly. you don't have the guts checks. Yes, you're like you said, the smoke grenades aren't there. But you know, smoke grenades are going to play a less of a of a thing going into N four now that we know you know that. Uh, multi protective visors see through clouds now, or smoke clouds now. Whereas, like, right. you know, people like Pan O have no smoke grenades. Doesn't exist in our army. So we had no way of combating. You know, a lot of, te- a lot of times you can throw smoke grenade for smoke grenade and you're good because most, most armies have them. Pan O does it. Now we actually have an effective way of dealing with it. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, the, the announcements that uh, Carlos made with the upcoming tags that are coming out for Pano, or not Pano, uh, for Code 1. For Code 1. Um, and the fact that that right there is where you're going to be able to get to your 30 points. I'm excited to start playing those kind of games with tags in there. Code, I, I'm gonna, I'm, I think I'm going to enjoy Code 1 for the next few months. Uh, while we wait for N4, and probably even into when N4 releases, I will be yeah. continuing to play Code 1. I don't know that I'll stop playing Code 1, honestly. I mean, I think I'm going to get in 4. I think I'll play games of in 4, but I don't think I'll ever stop playing Code 1 yeah. games. Code 1's just a really good system. It's it's a ton of fun, and I enjoyed the hell out of it. I think the thing for us, as far as Code 1 goes, is that uh, I think our community is, is a little more developed than Chris and I are, mm-hmm. and people are chomping at the bit and beyond Code yeah, 1. And- we've got a lot of really good Infinity players in our area that have been doing this a lot longer than we have, so you know they, they've got the the experience and which is great too, because these guys are excellent teachers as well too. They've all of us, all of them have been very patient. I know at least with me, Nathan, one of the, the local Pano guys, he's been very patient with me, which I've appreciated. Yep. Well, and yep. Th- but this is another really good thing is that code one is this excellent infinity teaching tool, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. but also a game that's, it's fun for veteran infinity players. I agree, I, and I hope to be able to, to to play a couple of games with the of Code One with the other with the our experienced guys, and hopefully they'll see how much fun it is. Because I think I think a lot of them have been looking, you know, taking the profiles that were leaked or not leaked, but were announced during the Infinity in four week, and they've taken them already and adapted them into to TTS, so that way they can already start playing. Like I know guys are already playing with Cosmo floats already uh, with the new profiles to test things out. And then they're already going with what in four rules have been shown. Uh, and they're just, sure. they're getting ready to play. They're, they're excited for it. And I get it. I understand why they're excited for it. These are some competitive guys that like the tournament circuit. Yeah. Yeah. But we're, we're new. Yeah, I'm so new. good one is a, is a lot more, a lot more interesting, but I mean, and, and in all honesty, Chris, that was the most fun I've seen you, have playing infinity because you weren't caught up in all the minutia. Yeah. And, uh, and I, hate, three, so. I hate to do this on air, but I will do it for posterity's sake. Uh, you were right. Um, I should have yeah. never been playing sectorials with fire teams. I could have been playing sectorials. I should have just never been playing with fire teams. Yeah. I like, like, like I said to you before, I think taking that out just to learn and to get started, I think was probably, I, I think it did. It benefited me. Um, you know, just just because because then I understood where what their benefit mm. was and and how they how they could change things for for the better, and it came down to understanding that not not every model has to do everything right. right. But then also, like in your case, uh, the 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 fire team that you're bringing is a is a mobile fire team, so that's a lot of positioning issues, yep. right? So you got five guys that you're trying to keep. Uh, track of as you're moving and if you don't know what you're doing it can be hard enough to move one guy uh, to minimize AROs let alone five. Yeah and I think it's I think it's one of the reasons why I think going into N4 and Code 1 going and choosing a sectorial in N4 I think I'm as much as I want to play military orders because it's my jam like those holy zealot knight kind of armies is the, the, the what attracts me to a lot of these things. I think I'm probably going to Look at playing Svalheim and or Varuna, and I because I have a lot of models for Svalheim already. Uh, so it's with with Kaldstrom and what Nisses I already own before. I think I'm probably going to pick that up because it's more of a stationary uh, army, so it allow me to learn more minute movements before I go into the larger scale movements with that military orders require. 
Yeah, probably probably not a bad idea. Yeah. And that's what, you know, that's 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 kind of it is figuring that out and just kind of picking that place to start and to to learn from Plus space vikings, you know? Well, let's Plus let's bring vikings. it back. Let's bring it back to code 1. Bring it back to code 1 cuz the code 1 like I I feel like that was what we what we wanted to focus yeah. on code 1 specifically in this episode. And what I'll say and what I want to say about code 1 is that if you have never approached affinity and you've never played infinity um, because the, the intimidation factor was too high, find yourself somebody who's familiar with the system and get a demo of the game. Um, I am a, I am now a true believer in, I, I mean, I've always been a fan of infinity, right? Forever. I think infinity was one of the first games I tried to get into after I got deep into Malifo. Um, and I was never able to really like crack in, but now I feel like I understand much more of the game and I, and having actually played code one now, I can say that it is the definitive way to start playing mm-hmm. this game. And it is a very good way to get into the game. If you have any experience playing any skirmish games, and I think the game will make a believer out of you too. Yep. I agree. So yeah, that's, that's the interesting thing too, right? Is that they do delivered on what they said code one was yep. going to be, which was infinity, but streamlined. And, and you guys know when we first looked at the code one rule book, <laughs> I said, there's no way that a 104 page rule book is going to be streamlined. I know. Yep, I remember and, that. And you're, I, I, as you said that, I was like, boy, he's putting, he's, uh, he's eating crow. He's eating crow live on the mic. <laughs> I <laughs> am, I am eating crow. I, I'm wrong. They did it. And I mean, I, I, I did not think that when they put out that rule book and it was that big that it was going to work. Yep. And I had my doubts about whether you could streamline infinity anyway. And they did it because they give you the core. So you're playing Infinity. They kept all that, all that core, that core game engine they kept. But what they removed from it was the overwhelmingness of options. Mm -hmm. You know what the truly astonishing thing is? The truly astonishing thing to me about Code 1 is that you can get mastery of Code 1. You can play Code 1. You can dive into Code 1. And every single thing you learn in Code 1 is valid and in 4. Yes. Yep. yep. That is incredible to me. All it does is add yeah, on. Yeah, in 4 is in 4 is bolted on extra rules from Code 1, which is a fantastic way to teach players how to get into your game. And it's a great way to transition into a new edition. Yeah. An unbelievable feat to me is that they've been able to create a game that feels as good and as complete as Code 1 and that nothing in Code 1 is invalid. In, in four. Because, I mean, take, like, take right. a look if, if COVID had never happened and mm-hmm. the amount of people that would have been able to actually get a lot more physical games of Code 1 in and, and where well, people I mean, it, if you remember the timeline, Code 1 was launching at Adepticon right. and Adepticon didn't happen. So literally no one's really been able to get out and play it. Like, they just lost that time completely. But you're right. Like, it, it would have made all the difference. Mm-hmm. Well, and here's 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 something that I, I really believe Code 1 was intended to do. And... Really what it does is it kills that, hey, there's a new edition coming, nobody's going to play kind of lull. Yep. Yeah, it, di- it did do that too. It gives you that new edition so you're excited. You can play that new edition. And so you're already stepping up in those like two, three months before a new edition where when you see that with other companies, people are getting away from it. Right. People start stepping back mm-hmm. and, and be like, well, I don't want to play because I'm going to wait. Well, in this case, y- you play code one and you're getting ready for that next edition. But it also solves a problem for Corvus Belly of how to introduce new players to this game mm-hmm. and how to continue their operation skews where they're putting out these two player battle boxes every year. Because now, I mean, if you think about it, they've given themselves at least two years of runway. Right. Because they have two more main Mm -hmm. factions and two more factions to add into code one, plus the ability to, you know, basically make code one deeper as they go and as they choose. 
So it's an, it was an incredibly smart way for them to be able to introduce and probably new sectorials too, right? Mm-hmm. Because the armies that will be vanilla Code One factions will probably always be sectorials uh, in the main game. Which uh, to me, it's just altogether genius. Like it, it was it, like I think everybody looked at it with some skepticism, but I think with the benefit of hindsight, we can say that it was a brilliant move on yeah, Corvus Belli's. And, and here's here, here's an here's another way in which it's brilliant. Right. We just lost Guild Ball. Right. What was the problem with Guild Ball? You couldn't change the competitive hardcore side of the game without in, without pissing off your hardcore base. Mm-hmm. But you also couldn't make it more new player friendly. Corvus Belly right now is having their cake and eating it, it too. They, they have, have a yeah. way for people to be able to get into the game to experience it, mm-hmm. right, without having to dumb it down or change it so much that your your hardcore competitive players or your long-term players are getting pissed off. So now that we have that comparison as well, they look like fucking geniuses. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very much so. Agreed. Hard agree. So Chops, you hit you hit something that I that I was thinking about and I know we're, we're approaching like kind of an hour here. But so you both play multiple armies in in uh in Infinity. So how have you guys felt with the outside of O twelve, because since they're so new, how have you felt about your model selection for Shavas or not for Shavaz, for a combined? Compared to, you know, looking at it from a sectorial and what options you get at the code one level, because obviously you're not playing sectorials. How do you feel like you're getting a good run of the mill with your with the, your your models or do you feel like things I, no, are missing? I feel like Shazvasti plays like Shazvasti in code one. OK, they don't play like regular combined. Um yeah, but because, that's fine, because one, th- one thing one thing to note about them, even though they're listed as combined army, technically all of those models are the Shazvasti sectoral. Right? Yeah, mm-hmm. like it's not it's not vanilla combined. Right, but if you but that's the, that's that's the same for the only one that's not true for is O twelve, right? Because Yu Ching it it like it is white banner, and uh, Pan Oceania is. Um, Svalarimer, a winter form, well, right? So, so like, Panos, Panos got a good mix. I mean, yeah, a lot of them are Svalarimer just because of the Kaldstrom box, but it actually still has Varuna models. It's got... All right, fair enough. It's got, fair yeah, enough. It, it's got Varuna models in it. It's got... Because um, the tag we're getting for, for Pano is a Varuna tag. Um, okay. And uh, so then, the, like, you get some Sw- Swiss Guard, I think, is Varuna as well, too. I'm not familiar with it. But you get a lot of other basic or- uh, orc troops, are, which are pretty much almost in everything except for military orders. So they, they got a good mix. All right. Well, either way, Shazvasti, I think, um, is is what's represented as combined army because if you think about the combined army right the con- the combined army is the the it's a hegemony mm-hmm. right of multiple right. races but in code 1 you there's only one option that you can take that I can think of off the top of my head that's not Shasvasti uh in the code 1 stuff so like there aren't any rodox at all Right. Um, I don't think there are any Batroids either, right? So you don't get nope. the robots either. It's it's really just Shazvasti, and then you have one Umbra. So gotcha. it's right. mostly it's just Samaritan. Yeah, yeah. So yep. it's it's really just Shazvasti okay. um, and some and 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 the drones too, right? Right. But like, right. So yeah, you get to use Doctor Worm, uh, and you still still get that. But you got that in Shazvasti in the Sectorial as well. So. It really and, and really, it, they have um, a ton of stealth options, just like they do in the sectorial. So they, it really does feel like playing Shazvasti, but I don't think that's limiting. I think that's fine, and I think it, it again it, that for the sake of Corvus Belly being able to have a core product line in a store, if you want to play the aliens, they're pretty cool in terms of like all the cool aliens that are in combined the new Shazvasti models are pretty rad so it's fine cool. and, yeah. and if I'm being honest the raddest models from combined are the Umbra and you get a Samaritan so it's fine it's totally fine <laughs> yeah which is a really cool freaking model as I hold him in my hand yeah if you think about Reaper from Overwatch that's kind of what he looked oh, like oh yeah that yeah I can imagine why that would look well code one 
Yeah, I think that kind of rounds up our Code 1. Our I Code 1 Part 2. Yeah, Code 1 Part 2, Electric Boogaloo. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> um, Hacking Boogaloo, maybe that's better. Let's let's go into some final thought. Chris, final thought on your first Code 1 gaming experience. Code 1 has solidified itself into the fact that Infinity, Legion, and MCP may be the only games I ever play ever again. Well, you know, for now. <laughs> for now. Until, it's, until it's, we it's, find it, the yeah. next hotness. But right now it yeah. is uh, – I, I think it's you. my top game right now. I, I think it's I think yeah. it's king. I think it's dethroned Legion. It's finally – something's finally dethroned Legion for me. Yeah, I think it's a it, – it, it, I don't know that it will worm its way. I, I think actually, you know, I, I can't lie to you guys. I sent you the text. I think Infinity is going – probably to be my main game unless something else comes around i think i'll still play a song of ice and fire mcp and malifaux a lot um but infinity is a hell of a game and code one is where i want to be playing the game right now and i think it's a monumental achievement in design and marketing Mm -hmm. really for corvus belly i think they've done a phenomenal job and i think anybody who's been fence sitting on infinity go by operation called strom and just give it a shot it's just it's such a good game it's such a good system and it's such a good way to get into the universe agree uh wow you just you just kind of wiped out what i was thinking um so so okay so here's here's what i'm gonna say uh, as my final thought one of the things that that we're always concerned about with with playing games is is essentially value one way or another we're concerned about value whether we're complaining about the prices of gw or the quality of plastics or details on minis <clears throat> that all comes down to value one of the things that gives more value to a miniatures game is when you're not playing it, what are you doing? Yeah, right. Are you thinking about it? Are you painting it? Right? And I feel like Infinity's value for your dollar increases because it's the kind of game that you can think about when you're not playing. Slow day at work, thinking about your models and, and what kind of list you can build. And that's, like, important. You know, to me, that's an important part of a game. And I feel like that's something that I've been missing in a game. And since we started doing the list building for Code 1, I feel like that's kind of those juices are flowing again. Where, you know, cutting the law and walking around thinking about infinity lists. Yeah. And also, like, thinking about games, right? Like, five days later, I'm still like, oh, damn, I should have done that, right? Or like, what if I brought this model instead of that model? It, uh, and, and, and thinking about like my, my turn three gambit that went totally sideways on me, right? <laughs> like it just, it's the kind of game that like haunts your memories, like the best kind of movies do. Right. Um, exactly. And, and that's, and that's, even though you're not actually touching your minis and doing stuff with your minis, that's still value that you're getting. Cause that's time you're spending with the game. Yep, I, I agree. I th- and I think that's really an intangible that people don't talk about with minis games. And I think you're a hundred percent correct. Yeah. I agree with you wholeheartedly. I don't think I'm thinking about the game to the level that you guys are, but it's definitely on my mind a lot more than probably anything has been in a long time. Yeah. I'll say my hobby brain can't stop Kings of war and my gameplay brain can't stop infinity. Just can't stop thinking about it. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, that's our uh, thoughts on Infinity Code 1. Thanks for listening. Uh, especially a big thank you to all of our patrons for supporting us, especially especially right now as we've, uh, you know, all usually when when one of us has a, a hard time and a lot going on, the other two can pick up the slack. But it seems like right now all three of us are getting hit left and right yeah. with craziness. So we've been a little inconsistent. So we apologize for that. But thanks to our, our Patreon supporters for, for supporting us through all of this, all of our craziness and our personal lives, you know, thanks to static as a city for the wonderful music. Um, if you, if you going back to Patreon, if you want to support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash three men in a war game, you can find us on all of the social medias. Uh, again, with the craziness and the personal lives, that's kind of slacked off a little bit, but that's should be coming back as things ease up and uh join our discord it's the best discord out there without patting ourselves on the back too much it's, it's pretty it's great phenomenal we love we love interacting with everybody on it 
uh, always, always learning good ideas and, and meeting new people. It's been, it's been great. So come join that. It's a, it's a great gaming discord. So, uh, thanks for, thanks for listening and we'll see you, uh, hopefully sooner this time rather than later.